Galatians chapter 1, the second half. The more I think of Galatians chapter 1, the second half, it's sort of, sort of on the order of a testimony, I believe. The setting is Paul uh, and there was quite a few people who was having difficulty with his apostleship and so that was one of the problems and then ceremonial, uh, the way they done certain things and carried them out, but this really it's almost like a, a narrative, a, a story of how can, God can take someone who ended up being the chief persecutor of the people on the way or the Christians and who zealously uh, went about his duty persecuting and trying to drag Christians in and so on and so forth to go from that behavior and that person to to the man who ended up writing 13 books or so of the New Testament. So there's a, a great distance between those two. But for today, Galatians chapter 1, I'll actually start at verse 11. Galatians chapter 1 verse 11 says, But I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. Not according to man. And in these verses, it's going to tell us that Saul, who became Paul, uh, gives all of the credit to the, the revelation of Jesus Christ and, and uh, not on by talking to other men. Uh, it says, I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man, for I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. The revelation is unveiling or uncovering. So the information that Paul says that he has been preaching come directly through revelation of Jesus Christ. He did not go somewhere to be trained or he did not take part in any, uh, anything like that. He says, I didn't receive it from man. I wasn't taught it by man. It came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. So that is quite a statement. But you remember they was having issues sort of questioning him, like, you know, so how did you get to be an, a, an apostle? We can only imagine uh, what they was coming up with. But they was questioning his being an actual apostle. An apostle is a, a sent one. And so they had trouble with that. So Paul uh, is trying to get that, that cleared up, and that is what he's trying to do in these 13 or 14 verses here. And we almost have to uh, refer back because after he says in, a, in a, a, a one spot in here, I think it would be appropriate to spend a couple of minutes on Acts chapter 9, his actual... Uh, conversion experience and, and what happened to him there to help fit this in one place here together. But he says that the gospel, that he, it come directly through the revelation of Jesus Christ. Verse 13 is where he says, Galatians 1.13, For you have heard of my former conduct in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God 
beyond measure and tried to destroy it. So you have heard about all about my past. And there's a couple of different spots in there. Uh, and let me... Verse 14, I want to take a little bitty piece of that. It says, And I advanced in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous for the traditions of my fathers. The word zeal... He's been accused of zealously persecuting. Zeal is great energy or enthusiasm in pursuit of a cause or objective. In Acts 26.10, Paul tells how he had persecuted the Christians, saying, when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them. The words for I gave my voice literally mean I cast down my pebble. I cast down my pebble. It's a reference to the ancient method of voting in a trial by using a white or black pebble for the judges to indicate their wishes. So that's what they voted with. But Paul says, I... I am guilty participating in that. Well, Acts 7, 58, when Stephen was stoned. It is said that those who stoned Stephen put their coats at Saul's feet. Executions had appointed official overseers, and many believe that Saul was the overseer whenever Stephen was stoned. I'm sure that Stuff like that was what helped Paul get the, the name as the chief persecutor. So he goes from one extreme to another, which lets us know that God can take somebody and totally transform them. There are several key spots in Acts chapter 9 that lets us know Remember whenever he was on the road to Damascus and he was hunting letters or coming up with letters so he could put more people on the way or Christians in chains and then there was a light came from heaven and Saul fell down to the ground and said, Who are you, Lord? And then so his conversion started happening and part of his conversion was he was baptized and he was filled with the Spirit. He was converted. He was changed. He had to go through a process there of being led. This is, this is the, the chief persecutor. And he's being led because he couldn't see into the city and told to go talk to Ananias. Uh, he, he, it, it had to be a very, very humbling experience for him. To go from that as a chief persecutor to now through this process of his conversion where God removed the scales, took the scales off and allowed him to see and when he was filled with the spirit then he can start looking things through a, a spiritual lens and understand the things of the spirit. Acts 2.18 says, just one short verse, Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he received his sight at once, and he arose and was baptized. So just like when this happened, God still today can change people's lives. They can become converted, that word that we used to hear a lot, con Somebody being converted, being a transformation, like Romans talks about, not being conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And some people have to be physically knocked down, really, before they will wake up and figure out what, what is going on. But how many times have you heard about 
somebody who, uh, in our day and time, I can think of one family, family member, will not mention his name, but one of his friends that he used to run with a long time ago, he, uh, he asked about him and said, what's he doing? I told him, he said, no way in the world. I said, yeah, he's been pastoring for about 30 years now over in Indiana. And he said, you're lying. No possible way. Could not happen. But God can do that. He can change lives. And this, I believe, is a, sort of like a parable to me, helping us today to understand just how God can take and transform people. And it's almost like they're a, a totally different person. <clears throat> there are several important things, Galatians 1, uh, that, that Paul realized starting in verse 15. It says, But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace. So Paul is saying, and he realized that God knew about him from the very beginning, from the very start. But when it pleased God who separated me. So God knew about him from the very start. And Paul was aware of that and realized that. And then it says, verse 16, or a uh, last part of verse 15, and call me through his grace. Grace, unmerited favor. Thank goodness that we have all and will continue to have a lot of, of grace from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in our conversion process and in our walk. <clears throat> Verse 16, to reveal, but when it pleased God through his grace, to reveal his son in me. So that's what Paul was trying to get across to the people. Jesus was revealed to me didn't come from some other man. I wasn't taught it, but I had a, Jesus was revealed to me, verse 16, to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the Gentiles. I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood. And then there's a segment in here about after his conversion experience on the road to Damascus, and that process, every spot that I could find and research, they was talking about how many believe that the, whenever he left shortly after and went to Syria, that it was a time of, of seclusion and solitude and just spending time in the Old Testament scriptures and spent time with God. And then whenever he came back, verse 18, Then after three years I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and remained with him 15 days. And then he went on and spent time with James. So evidently he got his, his spiritual education during that, that three-year period. And he's letting them know that that is how. That's where I got the information that I am preaching. And then verse 2 goes on and talks about that he preached with power, the power of the Holy Spirit. I guess maybe the moral to, to this is, to this story is, if somebody can take someone who was the chief persecutor of the Christians and change their lives, turn them around, the word repent is we are, we're headed one way and we turn and go in the opposite direction is what repenting means. We just, there's a turnaround. We turn around and start going the other way. That's exactly what happened to Saul who became Paul. 
This offers hope. This offers hope. For those who have, if you know of anyone or has a family member who has been going in the opposite direction, the wrong direction for many, many years and don't want to listen, don't want to hear anything, just leave me alone. For those like that who are going in the opposite direction, I believe according to Scripture, it's our job to pray for them. And this is how the Bible tells us we can pray for them. We can pray that the Holy Spirit will convict and draw and, and woo them to Him. We can pray that conviction will come on them. They will become convicted until they find the answer which is Jesus Christ. So that is how we can pray for a loved one, a family member, a friend. Lord, draw them to you and allow them to have the scales removed off of their eyes where they can see, I need help. Conversion. To go from this direction to the, it's like the, the extreme on both ends. All the things that was accomplished. It eventually cost Paul his life, his apostleship, as well as the other apostles. It cost him everything. But God saw fit to leave this for us to where we can read it and scratch it out and learn from it so that we can become changed and converted and try to minister and help somebody else and we can pray for them that the Lord would convict and draw. I'm sure we've heard many, many times recently how it is so important that this country, not only this country, but our world would, as Chronicle says, repent and cry out to God for mercy. We can do that on behalf of those that we know, our family, different ones that we know, our friends. But this chapter, Paul says, you know my story. You can, you can hear my story and hear what change happened to me, how my life was turned around. So that is why we, we preach and we teach and we pray and cry out to God for the ones that we care about and the ones that we love. Because it's very important not to take our eye off of the goal. It's easy to get caught up with all of the stuff going on and sort of lose sight of what the goal is. The most important thing is what we do with Jesus. What we do with Jesus is the most important thing. Because the Bible says that one day we will stand before him. I hope that chapters like this in Galatians uh, as a, a help and an inspiration and an uplift and encouragement and everything positive that we can learn from these particular passage and just be made aware of again and hit refresh and go back and keep praying for somebody that we might got a little bit lack in praying for. We're on our way home. Those people on the way, they was on their way home. <laughs> and we're on our way home. We're just passing through for a while. We're heading home. So this is important. 
what we do with Jesus. Let's stand. Thank you.